you've always been one of my favorite people to talk to in Silicon Valley because you don't just look at things at, from a sort of tangible right now, this company, what does my investment mean point of view. You think of the Valley from sort of a, a, a bigger thought experiment point of view as well. And you've been teaching this class at Stanford recently. And so you've been sort of, even for Peter Thiel, meta thinking about entrepreneurship in the Valley. So I want to get into some of that tonight. Um, but let's start out and talk of ambition in Silicon Valley, because I think people outside the Valley think that Silicon Valley is a very ambitious place. It's a place where young kids come and, you know, want to start something that, you know, changes the world is the cliche, um, or if you're more cynical, something that creates billions of dollars of, you know, net worth for you. Um, but in some senses, ambition has really changed in the Valley over the time you've been a part of it. Um, we first got to know you with PayPal, which was even more ambitious when you and Max first talked about it than it wound up being in practice. Yes, well, I, you know, I, th I think there's, there always, always are a lot of different threads going on at the same time, so it's hard to speak about any given thing. But uh, there, there, is, there is a striking way in which we're still suffering from a hangover from the 90s. And, you know, the 90s were characterized by uh, people who had these very ambitious projects for how technology was going to change the world. And uh, a lot of it sort of didn't quite work. The businesses cost too much money. They ran out of money. We burned through $180 million before we got to break even. The burn rate was uh, $10 million a month or greater from March of 2000 through September of 2000. Um, we, we raised uh, $210 million. We came within $30 million of running out of money when we finally got to break even. And, and you guys were not considered an, an edge case or an extreme <clears throat> case. It was... It was definitely not an extreme case where many companies had burned through a lot more. Um, uh, we were probably one of the ones, I think Amazon was the big one that burned through a lot more and that sort of came out. When Webvan, I think, was one of the biggest and, as well. Uh, yeah, well, and then there were all the other that burned through a lot and didn't survive. Okay. But, uh, but, um, but so the 2005, 2006 post-mortem I had on it was that one could learn nothing at all from this. And it was just sort of, there were things about we built a great team and, and, and people and things like that. When I've looked back on it in the last year or two, though, I, I do think one of the things that helped tremendously was that there was a great vision about how to transform the world. And even though we burned through $180 million, we were at least able to get the $180 million to right. burn through. And, um, and there was at least something about it that was compelling and big enough to get that to work. Um, and I think that uh, people have, in many ways, gravitated towards um, starting ventures that are very incremental. Um, and sort of, and this, if you sort of think of these all as sort of um, hangover effects from the 90s, uh, people have shifted towards incremental prod products where you do an iterative A-B search for a business model. Um, you try to get traction on very small amounts of capital mm -hmm. and then build it. Um, you try to often do tiny uh, things that are features of a feature to get things uh, to roll out. You end up... Um, 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 having an inspiring story sounds crazy um, on, on how, to, how, to build, how to build things. Um, and then at the same time, you know, even the details of the way the businesses have been built, uh, the shift, you know, in, in 99, all the talented non-engineering people at PayPal worked on uh, business development. So it was all about we needed to build it in relation to other companies. Mm -hmm. By 2001, the talented people were all working on product. Um, and in some ways, the shift from biz dev to product I think was a microcosm of the shift from the 90s to this decade. Um, and you shifted to product when you realized the world outside Silicon Valley didn't really like Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to work with us. They thought people in Silicon Valley were obnoxious. And so business development did not work. And so you needed to just have a product that rolled out on its own. And so the 2000s model was you had um, sort of people suffering from a mild case of Asperger's, creating product-run companies where um, you could sort of, it was only you and the computer, and you didn't have to deal with this very mean, hostile world that had uh, made itself uh, felt very unpleasantly now, after, um, after things crashed. And a lot of people felt that was better. Well, it was certainly better than companies going broke. But, um, but, but I think we have to also understand that this was in part you know, a reaction to things that failed. And the history is helpful because we're all still living through the aftermath of this in one form or another. And, you know, I think 
you know, people don't t take companies public early. I think that's generally a good thing. I think that's a permanent shift that's good. Mm -hmm. So I think there are some of these things are good, but I think it's worth rethinking all these business parts. So is it, is it a good idea to only have small incremental things, to never talk about the future because that sound, makes you sound like a crazy profit and we know that all profits are false profits. Uh, that's the lesson we learned from the 90s. Is it, a, you know, is, it, is it right to always have things that are you know, of this sort? And that's where I think it's worth rethinking things quite a bit. Um, if, you, um, if you frame it on the other side, you know, I think the great challenge people have in starting businesses today in 2012 is, um, is how do you build a critical mass of, of people that um, are really talented. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, I, I sort of always like asking a few pointed questions to people who are starting businesses. So the intellectual question I always like to ask people is, tell me something that's true that almost nobody agrees with you on, which is always... Um, that's one of ours. We have five Pando questions we ask everyone, and that's one of them. Oh, well, What's you, yours? Um, sorry. What's yours? What's your answer? My, my answer? Oh, my answer to my question? Yeah. Well, it's my question. It's our question as well. Well, well this, this will... I mean, this, to be fair, we've published it now about 60 times, so... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think you took that from me. I don't know. We, I think we, we, we have, we have I probably precedent did. on this. But, uh, well, uh, I, have, I have many answers to it. There are always, it's always an uncomfortable question to answer because you, you'll sort of end up offending people. But I'll give sort of a... Uh, the answer always takes the form of, um, I believe... Um, the truth is X, but most people believe not X. Or most people believe not X, but the truth is X. And so most people believe that this is an easy question to answer, and I believe it is a really hard question. And I think, it's, uh, I think originality is deceptively hard. People think it's easy to be original, it's mm -hmm. easy to be creative and different. All you have to do is wear black clothes and you're an artistic person. Um, That's what I've done here tonight. <laughs> um, I think you just went off on me in a but, Peter Thiel way. But, but I, um, you can, uh, but, uh, but you're not, you have no pretensions to be an artistic person. No. So, so the, 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 uh, I'm a capitalist so the pig. Yeah. Thing is not to, maybe, maybe I'm digging myself into a hole here. Uh, better stop. But, um, <laughs> But I think I think the question so I think I think um, I think that's actually a really hard question to answer. The uh, the business version of it is what great company is nobody starting. Mm -hmm. um, and then the pointed sort of um, team building version of it. Uh, whenever I have uh, a few people who are in the process of starting a company, um, that I ask is why will the twentieth talented engineer, you know, let's twentieth talented person join your company? when they can get paid way more at Google, they'll have to work way less hard at Google, it will look better on their resume to go to Google, um, and um, you know, what are you, how, why, why in the world would they ever join your company? Um, and you know, you can come up with, the monetary answer is generally not a good one, because uh, the monetary answer, um, you know, that works in a few rare cases, but chances are that um, you, won't, you won't, at employee 20, have a business that's so robust and doing so well financially that it's a no-brainer to people to join it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you think the equity piece, the sort of you know, yeah, the equity might be worth more, but it, it gets diluted. The 20th person doesn't get that much equity as a percentage. Mm -hmm. um, and so, what I, the the answers that I think work are that somehow you are in a really unique business. This is the only place in the world where you can work on this incredibly important problem, and um, and that's the kind of answer uh, you want to give. So it, it, um, it doesn't necessarily, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be, um, you know, you can sort of debate scale or anything like that, but it has to, on some dimension, be a really important problem that at least some people think is the most important problem in the world. And, um, and those, those are the kinds of businesses that are unique. When they work, they end up um, being leaders in their respective markets. Um, and that, that's sort of, I think, the, the general formula that works. And on the other hand, if you do something where you have 20 other people doing it, um, even though it might seem easy to start, it's extremely hard to build out. Mm -hmm. um, one, of the, one of the big insights that I've had in, um, in, uh, in, in organizing a lot of this material for the class is, um, is really thinking about uh, competition and sort of, people always sort of say competition is a good thing. And uh, I, think, uh, I think this is, sort of a deeply untrue notion. And um, I think uh, if you want to sort of frame it very simply, um, capitalism and competition are antonyms. 
Um, people always think of them as almost synonymous, but they're really antonyms. If you define a capitalist as someone who accumulates capital, um, and a world of perfect competition is a world in which uh, there are lots of businesses that enter and the profits are competed away. Um, and so, uh, so uh, the restaurant business in San Francisco is a very competitive business, but it's not capitalist. The airline business is very competitive in the U.S., but they, they haven't made any money in 100 years. Um, it's not a capitalist <laughs> business. Um, and in, in technology, it's worth asking what kinds of businesses are there that are unique, um, where you have, um, you're doing something so unique that you actually have real pricing power versus where you're competing like crazy. Um, Apple has real pricing power on the iPhone uh, and enormous profit margins. People who develop apps on iPhones, you're competing with about 600,000 app developers. Mm -hmm. And then you can sort of subdivide it into different verticals, but that's, that's, you know, it's not a great thing to do. It. And the fact that so many people are doing it doesn't necessarily make it better. That's, it makes it worse. And this intuition that, um, that competition is somehow a good thing needs to really be, be rethought. Um, so competition is not a good thing. It is, it is, it is, it may be a good thing from the perspective of society. Um, it may be a good perspective, you know, um, you know, uh, for if you like eating in restaurants, um, it's good that they're fighting each other to like give you good food at low prices. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but it's not a good thing if you're in the business of starting a restaurant. And so, so if you're, so if you you're don't buy the good competition makes you stronger as an entrepreneur. I mean, at PayPal, if you guys had, how many different versions did eBay buy or try to create that didn't make you guys stronger? Mm -hmm. um, no, I, I don't. I don't think. I don't think You know, I think. I think you. Um, you want to do something that you're passionate about and where you you get better. But competition, per se, is um, is, is generally just very destructive. Uh, people. People. You, you end up fighting over over things that uh, don't matter. And if you sort of think about the most competitive dynamics in our society, um, they are. You can sort of debate how how productive or or useful they are. Um, it's uh, you know. It's sort of like. Um, I and mean, there's sort of a lot of different versions that I can give, but I, I think, you know, I think PayPal was successful as a business because it was dramatically better than the next best, um, and it was it was better by a very big margin. Had it been better by only a small margin, mm -hmm. um, it would not have been a great business. Mm -hmm. The payments, you know, and so there was an enormous fraud problem. We figured out how to solve it. Um, our competitors had no idea how to solve it. Um, we figured, you know, there's sort of, and there were one or two other things like that that were that were sort of very radically differentiated. Um, if we had been no different from our competitors, maybe it would have made sense for eBay to acquire us, but it would have been a, you know, a, really, um, a really modest acquisition because they could have bought any of a number of other companies that would have been just the same. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so it's, you know, it's, monopoly is always a loaded word, but uh, you want to be doing something unique. You don't want to be doing something where you're just a commodity. And that's certainly true if you're, you know, if you're doing something as a person with your career, you don't want to be interchangeably competing with people. It's probably the reason people think of globalization. There, you know, globalization is always sort of touted as this incredibly competitive thing. The world's going to be flat. Everybody will be competing with everybody else. Mm -hmm. And it's wonderful if you're outside the world and you just are observing all these humans struggling on, on right. Earth, fighting each other. So from God's perspective, maybe globalization is a good thing. It's, it's not something people are reassured <laughs> about in the God US. cares about the people. Uh, well, we don't know. It's, you don't know about that. But, you know, <laughs> from, from the point of view of, of people in the U.S., you're not reassured by the fact that you're going to be competing with 1.3 billion people in China who can do everything for one-tenth the cost. Mm -hmm. um, and if you say, well, competition's good, it'll make you stronger, um, you know, I would, um, I would challenge you to say, go to Detroit and run for Congress and tell people how wonderful it is they're competing with people in China are getting paid one-tenth as much and how this is making them better. Mm -hmm. um, intuitively, people don't believe that. And, um, and it's, it's probably, you know, it's probably not true. So I think sort of avoiding these kinds of competitive dynamics is, is a really important thing to be aware of. I personally, you know, I, I, I was sort of, um, as an undergrad, you know, I was, I was sort of tracked very academically. I think education is a place where people um, are taught to compete sort of very ferociously. And this is true when you're um, high school, you compete to get into the best colleges, colleges into the best grad school, you know, grad school, you know, into law firm jobs or whatever, you know, professional tracks you're on. And, uh, and I sort of had my quarter life crisis when I ended up at a law firm in New York. And, you know, it was, um, it was the hardest I ever had to work. It was not clear it was ever going to lead anywhere. And, um, and it just, it, and it just, 
you were going to have this endless competition. Now, it's possible that at some point the competition would have made you stronger and then you could do something else. What I think happens in practice is people get addicted to the competition. They end up believing that um, things that are hard are valuable mm -hmm. and that hard and valuable are synonyms and that you should really be beating your head against the wall or more precisely against all the other people, uh, all the other people are trying to get the same things rather than um, going through the open door that no one is even looking at and just... Now, now I find this interesting because most of your friends would describe you as ferociously competitive. I mean, in the days of PayPal, Max would talk about you and Max competing on sort of everything. Like you would run, you would compete on math problems. Um, he says that, that you said that you guys should compete to see who would become a billionaire the fastest. I believe you've won. Um, well, well I, I, I'm not, I'm not going um, <laughs> to try to, um, you know, I, th I think there are, I think, I think that, um, I think that any time that I found myself in competitive dynamics like this, um, they're not healthy if they are the be-all and end-all mm -hmm. of, a, of a given situation. And, um, and I think there are probably aspects of my personality that were competitive, and really rethinking that was, was an important part of the idea of starting a company, doing something that was different that other people were not doing. Um, and, uh, and, and certainly there are, you know, there are all these dynamics um, where, uh, you know, there's some, some abstract sense in which you're competing in our larger society for things, but, but the specific things you are doing and working on, you're well served to find things that are extremely unique and where you're, you know, where you're not, uh, um, not simply um, encountering a lot of doubles or clones that are doing more or less, uh, more or less the same thing. Um, you know, I think the relationship with Max at PayPal, from my perspective, uh, worked very well because we were very complementary. I was focused on the business side. He was focused on the engineering side. There were certainly ways we overlapped. We both wanted to be very successful. But I think being successful or changing the world is not necessarily the same as um, taking for granted that the game that people are saying you should play is the correct game. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and so there are all these sort of, you know, um, you know the sort of these standard um, anti-road scholarship line is that uh, uh, these are all people who had a great future in their past. And, um, and, um, and it's sort of an odd question why, you know, why people who get these um, very prestigious awards do not end up doing better. And my theory is they end up getting addicted to competition. And mm -hmm. so they get something that was hard to get, and, but they keep trying to get hard things rather than getting valuable things. And we have to understand the hard and the valuable are, um, are possibly completely different. Are they different or are they at odds? They are, they are at least different, and in practice they're at odds because if things are hard because of competition, mm -hmm. um, they end up being not valuable. So again, um, getting to be the best restaurant in San Francisco, very hard, very not valuable because the second best is still close enough mm -hmm. that your profits are going to be competed away. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's the, there's the standard Kissinger anti-academia line, which was the uh, battles are so fierce because the stakes are so small. You say, well, people are rational. Why would you have a fierce battle when the stakes are small? But it's a correlation. The, um, it's, the stakes are small, so people have to fight for scraps. Um, and so that, that happens a lot. And those, those, that's a dynamic one, one needs to really try and avoid. So would we be better off as a country if we had more monopolies? We would be, um, we would be better off if, uh, if people focused on doing unique things rather than um, if people tried uh, to do things that were you know, undifferentiated in, in various, uh, various uh, tracked ways of one sort or another. Obviously, monopolies are bad in a static world, mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but if the trade-off is um, people developing unique technologies um, and you know, getting recognition for this either through a patent system which doesn't work terribly well or through business models where they can capture some of the value, um, that's, a, that's a much better society where people are innovating, creating new things, um, capturing some of the value for what they've created um, rather than one where everyone's trying to do the same thing, which is probably a static society at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So just to get back real quick to this whole notion of ambition, I mean, I, I agree with you about that we're sort of in this hangover. I mean, Mark Andreessen says it's sort of the Internet generation's Vietnam. I mean, everyone, you, one mm -hmm. company goes public and everyone says it's a bubble and just loses their mind. Um, but one thing that seems to have come back um, 
is this land grab mentality, is this first mover advantage mentality, mm -hmm. where you see, you know, if you think about how Yelp rolled out, is it was a business that was going to take multiple small network right. effects, <laughs> and it did in a very different way than, say, Webvan did. It was, let's prove it in San Francisco and be small. You know, now you have, you know, companies like Uber that are already expanding in Europe. I mean, there's this whole obsession with, oh, oh my God, the Somers have cloned me, I've got to go to Germany now, versus you know, focusing. And, and I think Groupon was you know, the first startup I had ever seen that went so aggressively internationally so quickly and didn't particularly go well for them. Um, I'm, I'm curious what you think of the first mover advantage of that land grab mentality in entrepreneurship and if culturally how that ties into what we talked about about ambition and sort of sm starting small because it definitely seems back in some way. Well, um, well I think the, the valuable tech companies are not the first movers or the second movers, they're the last movers. You know, Microsoft is a valuable company because it has the last operating system, and Google's valuable um, if it's the last search engine. And, um, and you can sort of, sort of uh, think of the, you know, various other companies in different categories. Say They'll, Facebook. Can't speak about Facebook. Um, <laughs> but um, various companies are valuable if they're the last in their, um, in their, in their category. And um, if you if you look at the and this is always the intuition is always that the value gets created you know very very quickly, um, but the, the reality is that uh, it uh, most of it gets captured over many decades. We did this sort of exercise at PayPal back in March of 2001, and uh, it was sort of looking it was sort of a financial modeling exercise of of, um, of and we've been in business for 27 months at that time, <clears throat> and we looked at sort of the you had a high growth rate growth rate like 100 percent. You looked at discounted cash flows, you used a high 30% discount rate. It turned out that about 80% of the value of the business um, was in years 2011 and beyond. We'd only been in business for two years, and most of the value was in the 2010s and beyond. And I would submit that um, most of the tech companies that are valuable today, most of the value is very far in the future. And so the question is, are they building a permanent franchise that's going to have, um, that's going to have real lasting duration or are they going to be superseded or something yeah. like that? Now, there are certain contexts where, you know, maybe the first sometimes are last. And so it's important to be first because that's the only chance you have for being last. So if you come up with a fairly uh, straightforward new model, which can be easily cloned, then other people can copy it really quickly. And so the only way to actually get to be the last mover is to be the really fast first mover and somehow take over the world really, really quickly mm -hmm. at an accelerated pace. Um, the, you know, but I, my, my preferred way to go about it uh, would be to try to uh, start businesses that the uh, Samwer brothers cannot clone. Mm -hmm. And so I would, uh, I would say sort of another, you know, another test would be, you know, um, yes, you can, we can sort of take over the world incredibly quickly uh, before we can prove the business model. To some extent, PayPal felt like we had to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the argument I always had for why we had to burn all the money through in 99, 2000 was email and money was a basic idea. Linking money and email was straightforward enough. People could copy us. We had to simply take over the whole world um, before anyone could catch up and before we could even figure out whether there was a business model. Mm -hmm. So we, we had the, the sort of the extreme version where I articulated 99 was um, we, we had a choice. We could either prove we had a business model or we could take over the world, but we didn't have time to do both. So we had to first take over the world and then later on figure out if we Did had a business. Did you make the right choice? Um, I think it worked. Um, I think in retrospect, we didn't have to burn through as much money as we did because there was more, there was definitely a unique technological advantage with the anti-fraud stuff that Max built and some of the other systems we, we built around that. Um, and I think also um, one, one thing that was actually easier in 99 than today was the internet was much smaller. There were far fewer people on it. So taking over the world, you know, it was like getting to, you know, getting to a few million users was like you had a significant percentage share of the early adopters and you were, you were well positioned to take over the world, whereas the world's become a much bigger place. Right. So, um, so that's actually, be, it's become sort of a harder thing to take over. And that's why I think, um, I'm, I'm still somewhat nervous about those as, as business models today. And I'd focus much more on the question, you know, why can't it be cloned? And, you know, there, there definitely are a number of businesses in Silicon Valley that have not been, that have not been cloned by the Samwer brothers. And I think those are systematically ones that are worth, you know, valuing more highly than ones that can easily be cloned. Mm -hmm. 
So you, you mentioned in working on this course, you've been rethinking a lot of things about the, about the 90s. Um, when, when we first met, when I was working on my first book, um, you know, I asked you if you thought it was right to sell PayPal. And mm -hmm. you said at the time that you thought it was. Mm -hmm. Do you still feel that way? Yes, although I'm less certain I was right about that. I, I think um, I think on the inside of these businesses, it always feels like things are really crazy, that things are crazier at your company than anywhere else. There's all the stuff that's about that can go wrong. There are all these things that are just beneath the surface that are catastrophically dangerous. And um, I think this was actually really true at PayPal. But, um, <laughs> um, but I think, um, you know, and I think, there was a sense in which if eBay could ever figure out what to do, they could replace our business in seven to ten days. It was you're like, so dependent on them. It was, and there was no easy way to get rid of the dependency. Right. So it was, you know, so it was a weird problem where you were, you know, you were on top of a platform, eBay, um, where the, which was two thirds of your market, and um, and eBay was growing very quickly. So in practice, um, there was it wasn't going to be less than two-thirds of our market because we couldn't figure out ways to really diversify quickly away from a rapidly growing market. Mm -hmm. And so we were going to be dependent on them for, you know, many years to come. And it was not at all clear um, that, uh, that something else could not have been figured out. And it was a deal where there were tremendous synergies, in fact, between PayPal and eBay. So it was actually a tech acquisition where there were some really big synergies. I think most tech acquisitions, the synergies are pretty weak. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think you know, I, I still think it was the right thing. With 2020 hindsight, you always have to answer these questions. You know, there's always an ex ante and an ex post version. Mm -hmm. So there's one version, which was as of July 2002, when we agreed to let eBay take us over. Was it the right thing at the time? It seemed really dangerous. It seemed like the right thing to do. There were a lot of synergies. It seemed like the right thing to do. Um, maybe we were overestimating the dangers, stuff like that. Not sure about it. Ex post. Um, you know, I think PayPal has grown a lot more. It would have been a very valuable business for us to have stayed involved with it in a variety of ways. On the other hand, I think um, it turned out that a lot of the people who were involved with PayPal probably did better than they would have done had they, had they stayed there. So I think ex ante it seemed right, and ex post I think it was definitely right. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about what everyone from those days has gone on to do. Now, if you were to, you know, go back and look at, let's say, Yelp, YouTube, Slide, LinkedIn, you know, four of the PayPal alum companies that I, that I think about the most. Would you have thought that they would shake out in the order that they have? It's, um, I don't, um, well, I, 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 this is, it's, it's, I don't, I don't have a, it's, it's not clear how one would have predicted exactly what, what was going to happen in, in all of these. I think, um, I think that, um, I don't want to sort of, you know, I don't want to sort of get into all the details. I think directionally uh, they did better than one would have thought across the board. So I think there are, at this point, uh, six companies started by uh, former PayPal people that are worth more than the original PayPal business uh, at the time of acquisition. Um, it's uh, LinkedIn, there's Yelp. Uh, YouTube, um, was it in 13 months, was from start to finish, was acquired for 1.65 billion by Google. There was uh, this Palantir Technologies, which I started with some of the ex-PayPal people in 04. Um, there's uh, Tesla and SpaceX, which um, Elon ended up starting. So they're they're actually the, um, so so I think the, the remarkable thing is that we had as many of, of these as as we did. And then there are sort of a number of others that are, you know, sort of emerging as pretty good ones in their mm -hmm. own right at this point. Mm -hmm. So everyone talks about the PayPal Mafia thing. And I know that you felt like after that Fortune magazine cover where you guys all dressed up as Mafia Dons that you told me the reason you agreed to it was you thought it was so ridiculous no one would ever ask you about the PayPal Mafia again. And yet I'm asking you about it again. <laughs> um, well, I think, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to know exactly you know what the what what the what the right lessons from it are. I think that uh, I think there was um, there was a degree to which the the big lessons we drew from pay, the PayPal experience was that you could build a great company and it was hard. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, when people um, have been in very successful businesses, um, they've learned that it's that it, um, it's not that hard. Uh, which I think is probably one of the reasons so few successful companies have come out of. Microsoft or Google. 
Um, so there were probably, you know, you know, the PayPal had about 200 people on product and engineering at the time of acquisitions. It was all out of these 200 people. Um, Google probably has 10,000. And, uh, and even though I think in some ways they are more talented than the people we had at PayPal in terms of IQ or sort of academic ability or credentials or all sorts of things, um, the lessons they've learned are not ones that would actually translate into building businesses. And then I think a lot of people were involved in businesses that failed. Um, and the lesson they drew, and it's always hard to know what lessons you draw from a failed company, but you typically learn that, uh, that um, you did something wrong and, and you typically think you took too much risk, so you end up taking less risk. Mm -hmm. And then you try something less ambitious, and maybe you succeed, but it's unlikely you succeed in a very, in a very big way. One of the, I think, I think, um, that's, I think that's one cut. You know, certainly, at the time in 2002 to 2005, it was a great time for people to start um, internet tech businesses, which a number of people from PayPal did. Um, not too many people were doing it, so it was, it was sort of a, had a contrarian feel to it. Um, I think there were some very great friendships that were started at PayPal. Probably the most critical thing when people found companies is who do you work, who are the people you start them with. And a lot of these businesses were started by people, you know, Yelp was Jeremy and uh, Russ and, and Reed at LinkedIn started with a few different people. And they were also started with like teams of people. Yeah, Chad and Steve. Chad and Steve and Jawit originally at, uh, at YouTube. Um, and, uh, and, I think that, uh, and I think that's actually worth thinking a lot about. Um, how well do you know the people that you're starting a company with? Uh, it's uh, one of the questions I often like to ask people when they're starting businesses is, how, how long have you known the person you're founding the company with? What's the history? Um, and um, if it's like you just met a week ago at an um, event in San Francisco, like and you thought it would be cool to start a company, you went here to meet somebody, uh, it's like, okay, it's like you're getting married to the first person you meet at the slot machine in Vegas. And, um, <laughs> And sometimes you hit the jackpot, but um, it's generally not, that's generally not good advice. And um, So are you better off going it alone if you don't have someone who you've worked with for a very long time that you have that relationship with? You know, I think there are, there are cases where it's worked both ways. Um, I, th I think, I still think the more common pattern is the dual, the two co-founders, where people sort of bounce ideas off each other and provide a bit of a reality check to each other. But I think there are also you know, some very successful models of the, of the solo founder. But I think, um, I think whether you have one person or two people as the, as the key drivers, there's probably an initial team of five or six people that, you're, that you build out. And I tend to think that works better if the people know each other reasonably well and there's, some, there's something organic about the way that gets built. And, um, and so if you have sort of like, well, great idea, but I don't know anybody. Um, that's like, from my perspective, almost uninvestable. Except for me. Well, yeah, but uh, yeah, I, I, we're not, we're not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not falling for that anymore. Um, um, what's your role at Palantir, and why was that an idea that made you want to be a co-founder? I mean, there are many companies you've been heavily involved with since PayPal. Not enough that made you really plunge in. Um, well, we. Um, we thought that there was, um, so Palantir Technologies is a sort of a, a data analysis uh, tool. It, um, it leverages some of the uh, insights we had from uh, the fraud technology at PayPal. We, um, we, we started as a summer project in my office in, um, in 2004. Um, and uh, it was, I, th I tend to think of it as like the first big data company. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, um, it's been used sort of by you know, it's used in sort of the government defense context. And it's been used by large, uh, fit, uh, large businesses to sort of detect fraud and figure out all sorts of things you can do, um, you can do with data. I, I, I thought that this was an important problem that uh, was not going away. Uh, I thought, you know, the terrorism problem um, was, uh, was, was struck me still very acute in 04. I think it still is in some ways. I believe that, um, I believe the low-tech solutions were all bad. You could basically have incredibly intrusive uh, things where civil liberties would be abrogated, or you could do nothing, in which case you'd have another terrorist attack, and then civil liberties would be abrogated. So from a libertarian perspective, I believe that we needed to, uh, to tackle some of these problems um, using technology to figure out, um, uh, to sort of figure out patterns of uh, where, who, who the terrorists might be. 
rather than um, using the extremely low-tech uh, systems we had where, uh, which didn't really catch the terrorists. And we're simply setting ourselves up for something even more draconian. And that's what I, that sort of was the, the sort of the, the philosophical frame. Uh, and then the, uh, the, uh, the but then I think the specific, uh, the specific part was, it also seemed like a very important problem to solve. I, I, th I thought that um, the U.S. couldn't take over the whole world and make it peaceful, and we couldn't be defensive and secure everything in the U.S. And so if the world wasn't going to blow up, we had to figure out a way to do this. And I think we're, you know, we are headed towards a more transparent world. There's things about this that are good and bad. Um, and, uh, and it was sort of, I thought that if I could be involved in building one of these companies, I could maybe shape it in a way that would be more good than, more good than bad. And we want, you know, we want to have transparency, but still respect for individual yeah. rights and liberties um, and um, versus, uh, versus, but you know, the opposite of transparency, you know, it's not always privacy. Sometimes the opposite of transparency is criminality. Um, right. and, um, and so, you know, if the, uh, the, in a transparent slogan world, the slogan is something like Google's don't be evil. Um, in a non-transparent world, the slogan uh, that I think a lot of businesses and, you know, some of the venture capitalists that we think of as competitive to us had would have been something like uh, do a little bit, little bit of evil and don't get caught. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe that is, um, that that was the business slogan for an awful lot of businesses in the 80s and 90s um, for a lot of investors. Um, and the problem with that sort of world is that it's a world where the people who end up running businesses or running government end up being borderline sociopaths, psychopaths. I think when people look back on the world from the point of the year 2050, they will say that one of the craziest things in our society was that something like 2% of the population is sort of borderline sociopathic, psychopathic, but the, the leaders, the business leaders, the political leaders, that percentage was something like 30 to 50%. And you ask, you know, how in the world could you have such a crazy society where you had the bad people making all the key decisions? Um, and I think it was because it was not that transparent. I think as our society becomes more transparent, um, that is going to change. I think that's that's going to be an incredibly valuable shift. So, so that's anyway, this not is a just long a truism that sociopaths tend to be the ones who run the world. They grab power. They're good at manipulating people. They're they're, they're especially well. They're they're really good at it when people don't know that's what they're doing. Hmm. And, um, and so, so to the extent it's made more transparent, it becomes much, much harder for people to do that. Um, and I think that is, that, is, that is a big part of the shift that we're seeing. And that's one of the reasons I'm very optimistic about, um, about a more transparent society being fundamentally a better society, even though there are all sorts of aspects of it that are uncomfortable and problematic and, and disturbing. But I think, um, I, think, you know, I think the privacy that is being lost um, is uh, I, I, I believe and hope is more than offset by, you know, sort of the evil criminal pseudo criminality mm -hmm. that uh, that is uh, being stopped, uh, starting with, um, you know, corporate governance. Right. Um, I want to talk about two more topics and we'll open it up for questions. So if anyone's you know thinking about them or if you're not, think about them. Um, so I, it seems that Founders Fund really made a switch at some point along the line. And maybe it seems more dramatic from the outside than it does on the inside. But you know, you guys were so early to the Web 2.0 movement. And you know, you invested in companies like a lot of the, the PayPal mafia that we, you know, we spoke about. Um, and you know, the, the company that shall not be named. Um, and then there's a manifesto on the site of, we want to fly in cars and we got 140 characters. Now, a cynic might say, well, when no one else was investing in things that were like 140 characters, you were investing in things that were like 104. I mean, it was slide much more substantial. Was was Yelp much more substantial? I mean, w was there a shift in thinking, and did it just have to do with market opportunity, or did it have to do with something that changed inside of you? Well, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't exaggerate the shift, and let me let me say. One thing, I think Twitter is a great business. Mm -hmm. um, I think people are too negative on it as a business. I think there are questions whether, um, whether it's going to, um, and I think the people who are working there will have jobs in 10, 15 years. The company's going to be around for, for a long time, and I think they have, a, have an incredible franchise. Um, it, is, it is an open question how much that's going to improve our society in decades ahead, and, um, and the and again, the challenge, and even and even more specifically, 
um, a lot of these companies may be instances of, of um, specific success but general failure. Mm -hmm. So s Twitter can be specifically a very successful business and a successful investment, but it may still um, it may still be symptomatic of a general failure. And so, uh, so if you had a thousand companies like Twitter, that could add up to to actually changing our society. Mm -hmm. um, but we actually have very few of them. And so that the reason people talk so much about Twitter is because there isn't that much other stuff going on. And so I think that's the way that, that I want to sort of nuance that a little bit, mm -hmm. where um, it's not a critique of that at them as a business or an investment, or even I think they're doing a lot of good in some some very important ways. But it's uh, it's more that uh, you know that for us to really have a better standard of living 20 years from now in the U.S., we need a lot more businesses like that. And we need to somehow get that get that to add up. Um, you know, I think I think that uh, I think we, we still are doing a lot of um, sort of internet consumer internet investing. We were in, you know, just in the last three years, we were investors in um, relatively early investors in Spotify. We were investors in Zocdoc. We're investors in Practice Fusion. Um, we're investors in uh, Vodazin, which is a um, mm -hmm. sort of a political company that's uh, here in the audience, in the front row. And you should talk to Jason here. So I think he's on one of our lists. You know, we do these weekly lists, and we're doing um, one on we um, Webazins. Um, and so there's sort of are qu quite a number of, of of these businesses we've kept looking at. It's probably still been something like 50 to 60 percent of our portfolio has been allocated towards that. And then we've also been looking at you know all the other verticals. It's mostly been computers plus something. So computers and biology, bioinformatics, mm -hmm. computers, and you know, the, the sort of SpaceX had a big computer technology link. And um, and what is striking is that almost all those areas are ones people are just not looking at. They are um, you know they definitely feel somewhat more contrarian. Whether they're good investments is is you know is, is somewhat of an open question. So I think you want to be both contrarian. And, uh, and fundamentally right. Do you, are you, you're obviously a noted contrarian. Do you, are you contrarian for the sake of being contrarian, or do you happen to see things differently than other people? Let, let me. <coughs> <coughs> um, I don't think it makes sense to be contrarian for the sake of being contrarian, because that assumes that um, that people have well-defined views. And I think one of the big things that shifted is people have no opinions anymore. So um, you know, during the bubble economy, we had a series of bubbles. There was the tech bubble in the 90s, and it was, it was, you know, it was good to be somewhat cautious about sort of the psychosocial mania. And there was, you know, a housing bubble in the last decade, and it was good to be nervous about the psychosocial mania around housing. Um, I think we still have pockets of that. So the only one I can really, the only bubble that I think is left in our society is the education bubble. Mm -hmm. um, although I'm not even sure it's contrarian to be questioning education because I found that an awful lot of people have agreed with me. So, um, so it's sort of, uh, you know, and, and when we, um, we you know, when, um, and, and so, um, but, but at any rate, or which may suggest we're sort of at the very tail end of the education bubble. But I think there are, there are almost no bubbles left because people don't believe in anything anymore. And so, um, and so <laughs> to be contrarian in a world where people don't believe in anything um, is to actually think about things, to have well-defined beliefs, um, and to anchor that. So, um, so I think the way to be contrarian is to think for yourself. Wow. Um, let's talk a little bit more about education. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting that you say most people agree with you. I think um, the story that I did about the education bubble and TechCrunch um, got, was the most trafficked thing I ever wrote for TechCrunch. And there were a lot of people who were ostensibly really angry about it. Um, do you think that... Did you count the percentages, though? Or did you count how many were... Favorable well, versus unfavorable. Well, so for us, it was definitely highly favorable. But I think that we're—I mean, we're—we we're, were focusing on technology, where most people have a bias of, you know, dropping out of school is okay. So I'm. Yeah, I, I think it's a well, it's it's, like I I, I don't want to say that you know, that um, I, I'm not I'm not, I'm not I, I think I'm right mm -hmm. about it, but I'm not uh, but I'm not sure I'm I'm that you know I'm not sure it's that controversial. Uh, a position to take. I had a debate in uh, Chicago, and it was sort of a, it was sort of a well-educated audience. Lots of people were in grad school or going to grad school. It was one of these intelligence squared things. They had a vote. You know, we sort of narrowly lost the pre-debate vote. We did better. We won the post-debate vote, but it was still, 
it was sort of an audience that we would have not thought of as being very friendly. The question was worded in sort of a mean way, which was resolved, too many kids are going to college, which sort of always sounds like you sort of uh, want to sort of just, you know, not give people opportunities. Um, and it was still a majority, the plurality of the audience ended up on, on our side at the end of the evening. So, um, so I think, uh, I think there, is, there are sort of a lot of questions about it. The, um, in thinking about the education topic over the last year and a half, um, you know, there's a lot of questions about what it is that people are getting with education. And the initial thought I had was that it's some combination of an investment and a consumption decision. You're investing in your future. Um, you're learning things that will make you better. Um, and then it's a consumption decision because at the same time college is like a four-year party or getting an MBA is a two-year vacation break from work. Um, and, uh, and so it's sort of this great combination of investment and consumption at the same time. And that's sort of similar to people buying a house with a swimming pool where you could say, look at how much I'm saving, and then you're consuming by saving. So there's right. sort of the same contradiction as with housing. Um, but what I've come to think in the last uh, year and a half is that most people don't really think of it as either an investment or consumption decision. And uh, it, the financial product closest to is that it's an insurance product. Mm -hmm. And people are basically investing in education to buy insurance so they don't fall through the big cracks that, are, that exist in our society. Um, I think it's a bit of a, um, it's a, bit of a um, cop out because we should be asking questions why the cracks in our society are so big. So if, you ha if we had a really healthy gun market where lots of people were buying guns and you were safer if you had a gun and other people didn't, um, you could say the gun market's healthy, look at how much people are spending on guns, but we should also ask questions, why is our society so unsafe? And I think um, there's an analogous question with education. If people are spending um, four times as much after inflation to go to college as they were in 1980, and you have this escalating arms race to spend money on it, what's gone wrong in our society with that? So that's the, that's the insurance problem. But then I think the, the real problem with it is insurance is that it actually does not function that way at all, and that most of education is actually a tournament. Um, and it is a tournament in which you have to beat other people. It's very competitive. Um, and, and you know, if you don't go to a top-tier school, um, your diploma ends up being a dunce hat in disguise. Um, and so it's not really an insurance policy. It's a fraudulent policy. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and that's, that's the part that I think um, is starting to surface um, in recent years. Now you've been, since making the stance, pitched on a lot of education startups that, that has suddenly become sort of a generally hot area. It was an area that the Valley avoided for a long time. What do you think works? What do you think doesn't work? Are you particularly persuaded by any of them? Well, it's, 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 um, a lot of them don't seem to, there's sort of a lot of things that are very tricky about it because it's hard for people to show, you know, you have to have a product that's actually better and that you can explain to people that's better. Mm -hmm. And I think that's pretty hard. Getting distribution's hard. So there are a lot of sort of idiosyncratic, a lot of challenges around it. And they often seem not as well differentiated as one would like. Um, the part that I think is, is sort of weirdly still off with most of it is that um, you have to understand what education is. And it's not an investment. It's not a consumption decision. It's an insurance policy. Um, it's perceived as an insurance policy and it's masquerading, um, and it's real, really a tournament. And so, um, and so to the extent you're going to be competitive in your education startup, um, you should at least, um, it should at least be, we're going to provide you better insurance than people can get. Right. Um, and, and so if you say, well, um, you're, you're going to learn all these things. Um, well, people aren't interested in learning. They're interested in getting a credential from a top school because that's how you get the insurance policy. So, um, so if it's not an investment or consumption decision, you have to at least figure out a way, how do you provide insurance to people? That's one question. Or, you know, we're going to help you win the tournament. Mm -hmm. So that's like the test prep courses and things like that are, are probably quite good. And again, maybe it's not, maybe we don't even need to put more resources into the tournament. But I think that those Wait, are the two. Wait, if the tournament's bad, is it something? Well, I think it's an immoral company to start, but that is at least it's at least dealing with the reality. Right. And you have to somehow engage in the reality of people are trying to buy insurance, or and or they're trying to win this tournament, and that's the reality you mm -hmm. should engage in. And if we talk about education as learning, um, you're not even you're just taking the sort of the weird marketing at face value, and that's not even what's going on. Mm -hmm. And so if you're saying we're we're gonna you know we're gonna um, help do that better, most of the time you're not even wrong. Mm -hmm.
Now, I want to talk just quickly about the uh, the Teal Foundation winners. I went to the um, event that you had this week, this past weekend, where I believe it was sort of a mentor matching thing, and the the students came out or the not yeah. anymore students, they used to be students, came out and they did sort of a two minute pitch of what they were gonna do. And I was expecting sort of a, a junior Y combinator. Um, you know, when we would do Disrupt at TechCrunch, we just would get so many social and badge companies and social and badge companies. And we'd, we'd winnow out a lot of them, but that would still dominate because that just seemed to be what people really wanted to do. And um, I was, I was floored because, first of all, I was at the Palace of Fine Arts and it looked a little bit like a high school auditorium stage. And these, you know, varying degrees of sort of awkward or just young looking kids would come out and it looked a little like, you know, I was watching a recital or something. And then they would t get to the podium and they would say things like, I'm going to solve global warming and some other problems along the way. Or I'm the youngest kid who's ever achieved nuclear fission. I mean, the. Getting back to ambition, I mean, I love this one. Um, the 14-year-old who, yeah, figured out how to build a nuclear bomb when he was 14 years old. <laughs> right. I mean, the level of ambition, getting back to our theme, um, there was a Nigerian-American kid who had these smartphone glasses that were, that were amazing, or a drawing for them. I mean, these were, I, I feel like not in your company, like, these kids would not be taken seriously in most places in the United States, let alone the world. Did you, did you consciously look for things like that? And do you, is it important that their ideas work? Is it important that they can achieve these things? Or is the ambition what's important? Well, it's, it's you know, I, I, don't, I, we don't, I, I don't want people to fail. I think, um, I, I do think failure is always very problematic. Um, I think that, uh, you know, I think it's a problem. I mean, it's, I think it's a problem even for, you know, for unambitious ideas because a lot of them fail. And when people fail at unambitious things, um, it still is psychologically damaging, and there's this path dependency to it. So I think it's, it's actually, you know, I, <coughs> I don't think sort of failing is a free option. Um, it's very important for us to sort of define things the right way. And the way we've, we've defined the program is that people will have two years to sort of explore a number of opportunities around that. They can try to start a business. They can try to do something on the nonprofit side. They can figure out ways to work with other people. Uh, but but, um, but the, the threshold for success um, that we've defined is very low, where it's just you have to have a better experience than you would and learn more and do, than you would if you had continued your college education. So it's very focused around them. Um, well, it's, it's, it's focused around their, we, we sort of match them up with mentors. Um, and, and sort of encourage them to, to work on various things. But it's, it's, it's not, there's no sort of, you know, we don't really have well-defined benchmarks or things like that. We like people who, who have, you know, really big ideas about how to change the world, but we don't want to, we don't, you never want that to be sort of a, um, a strange, you know, obstacle that, you know, sets yourself up for failure. Mm -hmm. So you've, you've said that when you were thinking about doing this program, you also thought about maybe starting a university. I mean, it sounds a little bit like what you're describing is sort of a Peter Thiel university. For well, it's, 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 um, well, it's, 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 we, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't really think it's really a university at all. So I mean, it's quite, it's quite different. But I think that the basic, the basic thought behind the program, I, I was looking at, you know, the whole education reform stuff for years. Um, I concluded that probably too much money was being invested in it. There was no way I could donate money to it. Um, that most universities that have been started in the last hundred years have not worked uh, on any level. And so um, I, some people at my foundation, this was back in 07, we did a whole, um, we looked at every university that has been started in the last hundred years in the world. There's been some that have succeeded, most have not. Um, and so, it's, it's a, you know, so the amount of money that's been spent on it is really high. The output's really low. And it's that sort of that study got me to thinking that somehow actually putting less money into it might be a good idea, uh, and maybe you should encourage people to actually leave the university context. And there probably are all sorts of different ways to do it. Um, we we decided to to focus on very talented people who are young enough to sort of make choices about different things. I think when people are 18 or 19 years old, they're often making choices for the rest of their life. They're not aware they're making these choices, mm -hmm. but they're sort of silently defaulting to it. Um, and so, you know, and, um, 
and and so I think it's a it's a really good time for people to rethink things. Um, you know, I went to college, I went to law law school, uh, but I think if I had to do one thing over, um, I, I would have liked to spend more time thinking about what I was going to do with my life. And I think in some ways the education system has become a substitute for thinking about the future. You go to school. Um, so it's like, what do you do in high school? Don't know. I'll go to college. What do you do after college? Don't know. I'll go to grad school. And the sort of tracking credentialing um, becomes a way to avoid thinking about what you're going to do with your life. We, we hope that this sort of program gives, gives all these people an opportunity to, um, to spend two years really thinking about how they might make a difference. And it's not clear that a super ambitious project can be, uh, can be built, but I think they will, they will end up working on something productive and, and, uh, and, and uh, more ambitious than they otherwise would have. Mm -hmm. All right, one more question for me. I, I swear that's it. Uh, I have many more, but this is the only one I'm going to ask. So I've been thinking a lot about um, something that Phil Libin of Evernote said the last time he uh, raised his, his last funding round before the one that's apparently underway right now. Um, and he said over and over again that he wanted Evernote to be a company that would be around in the next 100 years. Mm -hmm. Do you think any technology or consumer web company will last 100 years because there seems to be such an aggressive young eating the old. Um, and is that even something that's of value? Do you want companies you're investing in now to be around for 100 years? I, um, well, you know, it's 100 years is, is, a, is, is, is quite a long time. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's probably the wrong, that's probably the, it doesn't, it's not the right, it doesn't feel like the right frame to have. Uh -huh. <coughs> but yeah, I, I do think you want to work on things that are really going to last. Um, and so I think maybe 20 years would be, that would be a good, a good threshold. You know, the, the discounted cash flow analysis I gave suggested if 80% of the value is in years 10 and out, you know, probably want to be around for at least 20 years. And uh, if you're working on something that's going to be displaced by someone else in two years, you know, maybe you should work in the fashion industry. Um, <laughs> and so you, you want to be in something that's different from fashion. Right. All right, great. Let's take some questions. I think you guys have been patiently standing for a while. Yeah, so um, I, think, uh, I think there's, to my question, like an honorable answer and an honest answer. But my question is, when you're considering an investment, how much do you look at the individual as opposed to the idea? What's the ratio there? Um, it's, you know, I, th I think you want, I, I, we like to have both. So um, I think the individual is more important than the idea because you can't change the person, but you can change the idea. Um, but ideally you have both. How much was, uh, was that the case with, say, Facebook? Can't, can't talk, talk about, about Facebook. <laughs> um, both. Wow. Both. <laughs> All right. Let's. I, Peter does have to get to another engagement, so let's try to cycle through a couple questions. Let's so do. Yeah, let's do. Let's do. I'll, I'll, I'll give quick answers, but let's yeah, do five let's, or ten questions. Yeah. Let's I'll, try to I'll, get I'll, through as many. Hmm. Oh, you want to do one from this side? I'll. I'll, I'll give fast. So I assumed all these people standing were just burning with questions. Let's do another one here while you. But I have more questions if no one else does. There's microphones, guys. <laughs> Go to the microphone. It's hey, right there. Okay. Um, Peter, um, I have a question. It, a lot of your focus has been about investments in, in young people and young people f starting companies. I'm curious what your thoughts are about businesses focused on um, the largest demographic that's growing rapidly, people over the age of 50. Um, it's... Well, I, th I think there are, um, well, there, there's sort of, well, it's, it's an important demographic. The question is what the right businesses to start are. I think probably we've done a number of things around healthcare IT. That seems like the most obvious technological area to focus on uh, with that demographic. There probably are a lot of other kinds of businesses one could start. But, um, but I think, I, I, you know, it's, I don't, I don't generally think that much in terms of the age of the people who are likely to use the product. Okay, go ahead. Uh, very thought provoking. Um, Peter, you talked about the importance of ambition. Um, you also talked about some of the peril of failure. Um, if more people are ambitious or more ambitious, won't there be more failures? And what, how do you think about that? Well, I think, um, 
I think there are different ways you can fail. So if you try something very ambitious and it doesn't work, uh, you will at least learn a lot. You will probably achieve quite a bit along the way. Um, you will have maybe built a great team of people with whom you can do other things. Um, you'll get the 20th awesome person on board. Um, and, and, and so I, I think you will not have failed entirely. If you try something that's not ambitious and you fail, I mean, that's like, that's really demotivating. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do we have another person over here? Okay. You know, you talked on the subject of education and, and kind of the next bubble. Um, the biggest challenge that I find that education is perceived as almost a God-given right here in, in America and especially in a lot of other places in the world. How can business really kind of position itself to revolutionize that industry when there aren't any really business models, you know, given that context? I, you know, what are your thoughts on what is a business model that could truly disrupt education and position us for the future? Um, no, no great opinions on that. I think it's probably figuring out ways um, to substitute the credentialing process so, or to substitute you know, some of these things. So if people are buying insurance, how do you give them a credential more cheaply, mm -hmm. for example? But again, the network effects, all sorts of complicated things around that. Go ahead. Questions. Uh, one is, what's the most common question asked by your students? And then the second one is, how important do you think emotional maturity is, especially for these young kids that are putting these noble ideas of changing the world, up, you know, above happiness? Yeah, I don't know if there are any um, sort of. I don't know if there are any sort of most com people just ask different questions in different contexts. I don't have a good answer to that one. Um, you know, I think that uh, I think people. Um, it's, um, you know, I don't, I don't think there's a right or wrong age at which to be an entrepreneur. I think people can be very successful entrepreneurs when they're under 20. I think they can be successful if they're over 50. I think, uh, I think that, uh, I think that um, if you have an, and I don't think it's even, I think the question of becoming an entrepreneur is not even the right frame. I'm always nervous when people say, you know, maybe sort of a common question is something like, what do I need to do to be an entrepreneur or something like this? Mm -hmm. uh, I remember talking to one of my friends uh, a few years ago and it was like, so what do you want to do? And it's, why, it's very clear in 10 years I want to be an entrepreneur. And it's like, well, it's like if you're a writer, it's like I want to be famous or if you want to be a businessman, I want to be rich. Um, you know, but it's, it's, it's actually, you shouldn't think of it as, as this line on your credential. And people um, start businesses because they're really important problems to solve and it turns out the case to be the case that starting a new business is an important way to solve problems, and you should focus on, on finding important problems to solve. So you might be able to solve them in the context of a big business or a government or a nonprofit, um, but I think there are a lot of reasons that small businesses are, are really good ways to do it. But that's that's always that's a that's a question and a shift in emphasis that I'd I'd want to give, and then um, and then I think the the emotional maturity question is is sort of what are people's motivations for doing it. And you have to try to figure that out on a case-by-case -case basis. Do you think everyone can be an entrepreneur, given the right problem that matches their skill set? Or are there people I, who I don't, are I don't like. I don't like the question. I don't like the question. I think that it's, it's um, can everybody be famous? Mm. Right, so that's, or you know, um, can everybody be rich? I, you know, may, maybe, maybe not. And there's sort of a relative definition that's always tricky. But, uh, but it's, 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 can everyone find something important to do? Mm -hmm. I think the answer is yes. And, that, but, and I think that's the question you should try to focus on. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Oh, hi, Peter. Anthony from LinkMe. Um, the question about the 20th engineer for your business is a really good, big thinking question about your business. What are two other questions that you might ask that are similar to that when you're, when you're looking at a, at a business to invest? Well, in? they, they, these tend to be very good because they sort of, eliminate about 98% of the companies we talk to. So, um, um, you know, the, the, the one that I think is, um, is always really good is, um, is what is the salary of the CEO um, as an investor? And What's the right answer to that? Less than 150,000, um, even post Series A. Um, and, um, and then, um, <laughs> you're, always, you're always trying to trap me here, I know. Um, <laughs> but, um, Isn't that but, why you invested in me? Because that's being a good reporter. And it's, so if you like the people, you like the business model, you like the technology, you like everything, um, I found that that single question is incredibly predictive because it ends up setting the culture. Are people doing it for equity or cash? Um, it uh, drives the people who are being hired. 
Um, and uh, you know, I think uh, uh, sort of the random data point on LinkedIn when the, you know, I remember when it was getting started, Reed was taking a salary of $15,000 a year. It was the minimum, taking minimum wage so he could get health insurance. Um, and, um, and you know, maybe he didn't need more money or anything, but it was sort of setting, setting the right tone for the company. And, um, and, uh, and it's sort of, and you always want to sort of get to this question of motivation. Do people actually believe in what they're doing? One more question like that. Can we get one more like that? Because that's I, a good I, question. I, I, I can't think of another good one right, right off the top. <laughs> good. How big do you think this current bubble is going to be relative to the last one? I think sometimes we forget that Sorry. there were companies of $20 billion to $100 billion of valuation, like 100 of them from Siebel to Ariba to Commerce One, companies we've never heard of before. I, I think there's no bubble in technology. I don't think it's possible for there to be another bubble because people don't believe in things. Sorry, not bubble, but in terms of valuations of the exits that we're going to see. Um, the valuations will be what the, they may be overvalued, they may be undervalued, but I don't, I don't think we have a categorical bubble. All right. Hi, I'm Aaron Klein. Uh, first of all, I'm a college trustee who completely agrees with you on education. But, uh, but secondly, I'm a financial tech entrepreneur. And so my question is, from your perspective, why is it, and, and we're only a, you know, basically 12 months in, but why is it that so far uh, technology has failed to disrupt how we invest our money, how we manage our money? Well, uh, most people don't know what they're doing when they're investing money, and so they go with brand. And, um, and so it's very hard to substitute for the brands of the big banks. Um, I don't think they're doing a terribly good job. But, uh, but that's, the, uh, that's the core challenge you have. So it's like, um, I have a better way for you to invest money than other people do. Everybody's saying that. Nobody knows what's true. People end up uh, defaulting to, uh, to branded solutions. Um, and so it's extremely hard to uh, displace that. And, and so the, um, on the consumer side, it's very hard to sort out the marketing from the reality. All right, last question. Uh, what's what's your opinion on start or joining another startup before starting your own? I was uh, pretty opposed to it until I did it, and it's been probably the best decision I've made. Well, the uh, the most important thing is to again, I think the most important thing is to try to do something you believe in and that 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 makes sense. So it's again, it's I disagree with the premise of the question. It's like um, it's like it's linked to the question about entrepreneurs. Um, startup, it's you know you shouldn't do a startup for the sake of doing a startup. You shouldn't join a startup for the sake of it. It's it's a question about the specific uh, the specific businesses. What I think is true, I'll make one sort of um, uh, economic scaling financial point is that um, if these things work, they can work incredibly well, and it's a it's sort of a power law type thing. And so if you think of it as you know the the economic version. This is always as well. You're much better off starting a, your own company because you'll have a bigger percentage stake in it than if you join a company um, later on. And the reality is that um, um, the range in outcomes is so much bigger than um, the range internally. So it's actually much more important to figure out what the right company is. And you know, building a business from a valuation of one million to ten million is as hard as going from ten million to a hundred million. And that's as hard as going from a hundred million to a billion. And that's as hard as going from a billion to 10 billion, or 10 billion to 100 billion. I think going 100 billion to a trillion gets harder because you run to limits on the scale of the world. But, um, <laughs> but, it's, but, but it's, a, it's a power law function. And people don't understand that it's a power law. And, um, and when you don't understand that, you think, well, all that matters is that I have a large percentage at a, at a starting point of the business. That's, that's, sort of a, that's sort of a crass economic cut. But then I think there are, there are analogous things like that with happiness, culture, impact, all these other things. It's sort of a power law function. It's not a, uh, it's not, and it's, it's, it's a really big mistake to think that one startup is the same as another. They are, they are radically different from each other. I, I meant more on the what you learn while, by joining another company. Can that beat out your... Um, again, it, same depend, thing. Yeah, it depends, on, path, it depends right? on what you're learning who you join, what you're learning. It's very fact specific. You know, if you join the wrong company, you will learn all sorts of wrong lessons. <laughs> um, so it's the path really matters. I mean, I, I, think, I think one thing I sort of would, would just like closing underscore is, you know, um, don't think of your life as a random walk where, you know, or your company as sort of a series of A-B tests. You know, think of like, 
you know, the, there is this incredible path to dependency, and so it's, it's, worth, you know, it's worth really thinking about how, how it all fits together and how it makes sense. All right, I have one last question we ask everyone, in addition to the one I stole from you, apparently. Um, if you could have any mediocre superpower, what would it be? Do you understand the concept of a mediocre superpower? It's like, I don't ever want to be cold getting out of the shower again, you know? Or, I would like to be able to clean my room while sleeping, was one we got recently. Um, I don't know, could I teleport myself to my office when I'm 10 minutes late for a meeting? Yes. <laughs> and I've been on the other side of you being late, so I would appreciate that one. <laughs> I'm just speaking hypothetically. I'm actually usually later than you. Um, so uh, one quick announcement. Um, next month, uh, we have Dustin Moskowitz as our guest, um, the co-founder of Facebook and uh, founder of Asana, who you know very well. And uh, it's going to be an early one. It's going to be May 3rd, so we'll put tickets up. We're going to announce the rest of our lineup through September and some other stuff about the event um, in the next couple days, so watch the blog. And um, everyone, you know, stay, drink beer, uh, uh, have pizza, and, you know, find your next co-founder that you can get to know for years before starting a company. <laughs> and um, everyone, seriously, huge hand of applause for Peter Thiel.